Hello and welcome to our lecture six that is about GIS data models and data acquisition. So in our today's lesson, we will be learning about uh, the, the different GIS data models and the, the data acquisition uh, techniques. So, you know, in order to fully work on GIS, you need to have a, a data or you need to have the real world represented by some kind of data model. Model is an abstraction of the real world that employs a set of data objects that support the display, query, editing, and analysis. So, suppose you are interested in uh, bringing different real world features such as the building, uh, campus, river, churches, mosques, and the like. These are real world features. In order to work on this real world features, you need to have them in your computer. How can you bring all of this real world feature into your computer so that you can perform different spatial analysis? The basic, the first question that you need to ask is, you need to represent them. You need to use some kind of data model that can really represent those real world features. So there are different GIS data models. One is a raster data model. The other is vector data model. So you can represent real world by using raster data, or you can represent real world using vector data. So what is raster data model? So if the world is represented as a surface that is divided into a regular grid of cell, then you are representing that feature using raster data. The best example of raster data is the satellite image that you have learned in the previous uh, lessons. Remote sensing data is the best example of raster data. As you know it very well, remote sensing data is represented as a regular grid of cell. Each cell represents a value. So it, is, it, has, it has got a special name, which is pixel. So each cell contains a value. That value represents a measurement of reflected signal or some kind of interpreted value. So the size of the cell rep is represented by the spatial resolution. The smaller the cell size for the raster layer, the higher the resolution and the more detailed the map is. Suppose you have a raster data with a resolution or with a cell size of 30 meter and you have also a cell size of 100 meter. So the smaller cell size means cell size with 30 meter is the higher resolution and you can see features in a very detailed manner with smaller cell size. So raster data are useful for storing and analyzing data, data that is continuous across area, okay? So if the data that you are representing in raster data model is continuous, then the best way to use, the best way to represent it is using raster data model. So if it is discrete data, if it is not continuous, then you can easily represent it by using vector data model. Aerial photographs, satellite imaging, scanned maps are examples of raster data model. Here are some examples of raster uh, data models. So this is, a, if it is soil map, for example, each of the pixel has got its own coordinates, X and Y coordinates. And this is a digital elevation model. So you can see the elevation is continuous across an area. Then the best way to represent elevation most of the time is uh, raster data model. This is also a categorical data and it's, it is somehow continuous. This may represent soil of uh, an area. 
soil can be represented by vector or raster. It all depends on the, uh, the system that you have used to uh, produce your soil map. And the next thing is vector data model. Vector data model is a way of repre representing geographic phenomena with points, lines, or polygons. If anything can be represented by points, lines, and polygons, then the data that you are using, the data model that you are using is a vector data model. So vector data model are useful for representing and storing discrete feature, such as what? Buildings, pipes, and parcel. This is the difference between vector data model and raster data model. A raster data model is useful for representing continuous feature across an area, while a vector data model is useful for storing discrete features. This is a very important uh, distinction. And there are advantages and disadvantages of use, using raster data and vector data. For example, the, the, one of the good advantage of using raster data model is raster data model usually have simple data structure and they are efficient and easy in overlaying. So do not forget that if you are interested in making overlaying operation, overlaying of soil, overlaying on top of land use, on top of a river, on top of uh, different spatial features, the best way to use is uh, overlaying operation, I, I mean raster uh, model. Usually vector data models are not efficient in overlaying operations, so most of the time we don't use them for overlaying operation. The disadvantage of raster data model is inefficient use of computer storage, so it requires a, a lot of computer storage, a lot of space in your computer. So, and another advantage, disadvantage is uh, it produces error in calculating perimeter and uh, area because of it is it's uh, uh, it's it's nature, but in in calculating area vector data model usually are efficient. So there are a lot of advantages and disadvantages. You can have a look at them. Okay, once we have a very uh, good look at the basic thing of raster data model and vector data model. Now we go to GIS data acquisition. How do we capture GIS data? Okay, how do we capture? Suppose we are interested in um, capturing the distribution of banks in Ethiopia or the distribution of different government offices in Ethiopia. How do we capture that data? So we need to have uh, a look at the different techniques of data acquisition. So. Data acquisition in GIS depends on the data model that you are using. So you have a raster spatial data acquisition and vector spatial data acquisition. In raster data spatial, uh, raster spatial data acquisition, one of the techniques is spatial interpolation. Interpolation refers to the process of estimating unknown data values for specific location using the known data values for other points. So the best example for interpolation is rainfall data, pollution concentration data, elevation values. So suppose you have rainfall data on rainfall measuring stations. For example, Addis Ababa has three rain gauge station. One of the rain gauge station is found at Ntoto, at Bole Airport and at Ilri Campus, for example. These are three stations. But you can imagine how Addis Ababa is big in size. Using only three stations, how can you be able to tell the amount of rainfall in a certain area between these points, unless you are using some kind of interpolation technique? So using these three uh, measured rainfall or temperature data, you will be able to estimate values in unmeasured locations using spatial interpolation technique. So for example, you have this data, this is elevation data at this location, this location, this location. You don't have elevation data around this. 
So the best way to estimate a value between points of known value is spatial interpolation. By making spatial interpolation, you are able to have values in unmeasured locations. That is uh, important. And another uh, way of spatial data acquisition for raster data is remote sensing. So here is the link and the integration of remote sensing and GIS. Okay, remote sensing serves as input data for GIS, while GIS takes this remote sensing data to process, to analyze, and to produce output. So this is the difference. So I may ask you in your uh, in your assignment or in your exam, what is the integration of remote sensing and GIS? What is uh, the role of remote sensing for GIS and the role of GIS for remote sensing? Remote sensing serves as input for GIS, while GIS takes remote sensing data as input and processes the remote sensing data, analyzes and produces final output for remote sensing. So they integrate very well. And the third special uh, raster data acquisition technique is scanning existing resources. You scan it. During scanning, you may take care of the resolution. Most of the time we use 400 dot per inch scanner is usually good. For color area photograph, we can also use. And another the fourth technique is conversion of existing uh, data. Now let's come to how do we acquire vector data. The first technique is using ground surveying technique. You do your ground surveying technique, your ground surveying through uh, Tedolite. Okay? You, you collect the data on site. And the second is you digitize, manual digitizing. There are two forms of digitizing, on tablet digitizing and on screen. What is on tablet and on screen? This is on tablet digitizing. You have a big digitizer table. And the moment you move your cursor around the area of interest, it will be automatically encoded in your computer. This is on tablet digitizing. While you, you can also perform your digitizing operation using manual, I mean, using uh, on-screen digitizing. You use your mouse and you just click, click, click on your computer screen. Then it is going to be saved as a new feature. And the third technique of vector spatial data acquisition is GPS survey. You use GPS to collect data, GIS data. And GPS is Global Positioning System, okay? It is a handheld device used to collect location information, elevation information, okay? And also, you may also collect, you know, a lot of information using GPS, okay? So in GPS, you will be informed that there are a number of satellites revolving around the Earth used to be used to locate a certain location using this device. Okay? So using GPS, you need to uh, set up the, the coordinate system of the device before you collect your, uh, your data. So that's it. Now let's come to lecture seven, that is about coordinate systems and projections. So I want you to remind that in our first lecture of GIS, we have defined GIS by saying, GIS is a computer-based information system that has the capability to store, to retrieve, to manipulate, to analyze, to produce output on a geographically referenced data. So we have underlined the word geographically referenced data when we define GIS. So it's, it's all about, it's, you know, it works on a geographically referenced data. It works on a space-related data. So 
how can you make your data geographically referenced is a question okay but there is one technique that you can make your data geographically referenced by knowing understanding and exercising what coordinate systems and projections are so you need to learn a very simple uh, idea about coordinate systems and projections so what is a coordinate system coordinate systems enable geographic data sets to use common location for integration okay so you may need to integrate a lot of data okay you may need to overlay a lot of data to produce some kind of interesting output for decision making purpose for example it, suppose you are interested in in uh, producing output uh, related to disaster risk so you suppose you want to know an area which is highly vulnerable to flood hazard okay so there are responsible factors for flood vulnerability one of the things could be the elevation of an area the slope of an area the the population density of an area all of these factors need to be overlaid in order to overlay all of these factors you need to first define the coordinate system of the layers okay so you use coordinate system for such purpose so a coordinate system is a reference system used to represent the location of geographic features observations such as gps locations within a common geographic framework so when you define a coordinate system you are giving a common geographic framework to different data sets unless you have a common geographic framework you cannot overlay them you cannot perform different spatial analysis coordinate systems are of two types geographic coordinate system and projected coordinate system so uh, so each of the coordinate system is defined by uh, its its measurement framework whether it is geographic or uh, projected and the second issue is unit of measurement whether it is meter or in degree the third issue is the, the map projection what kind of map projection shall i use there are different map projections to be used in a coordinate systems this map projections works for only projected coordinate systems and there are other measurement systems properties such as uh, what are the datum what is a spheroid of reference and something like that so you need to know these four parameters in order to define a coordinate system two types of coordinate system frameworks geographic coordinate system and projected coordinate system usually when we say geographic coordinate system it's it refers to a global or a spherical coordinate system represented by latitude and longitude representation if it is a projected coordinate system most of the time we use universal transverse mercator projection this is a bit different from latitude longitude representation of geographic coordinate system but this is its unit is usually meter and it is projected coordinate system it is projected one okay next when we represent features using geographic coordinate system we usually use latitude and longitude so just to uh, to remind you the the lines that goes up and down from the equator are latitudes and the lines drawn and that goes to the left and right are longitudes longitude and latitude so this is and this is longitude and longitude you can uh, convert uh, from degree minute second uh, conversion from a degree minute second to a decimal format can be performed by this equation it's a very simple issue anyway when we come to projected coordinate system it is it, it is defined on a flat two-dimensional surface so as compared to geographic coordinate system projected coordinate systems are a representation of features on a flat two-dimensional surface it is projected projected from three-dimensional surface 
And a projective coordinate system is always based on geographic coordinate system that is based on sphere or spheroid. In a projected coordinate system, locations are identified by X and Y coordinate system on a grid with the origin at the center of the grid. So the origin of a planar coordinate system is typically located south and west of the origin of the projection system. That means it should move a little bit south and west. So the coordinate system increase from zero going to the east and if it is latitude it increases towards north if you are going to the south it is decreasing and if you are going to the east this is for longitude this is for latitude okay so the origin of the projection is being a false origin defined by the value of false easting and false northing because the origin is not zero zero. The origin is moved towards the south and towards the west in order to avoid the negative values in coordinate systems. So there is a term called false easting and false northing. Now another important issue in defining coordinate system is to define the the, the ellipsoid or the spheroid fitting. What does ellipsoid and spheroid do? So the best fit to represent the shape of the Earth should be defined by using a certain mathematical equation that can represent the shape of the Earth. You know, this is the geoid. This is the real shape of the Earth. So it bulges out at some location and it bulges in in some location. So it is very difficult to represent this shape of the Earth mathematically. So scientists have tried to create some kind of global best fit for this geoid. Okay, this global best fit is called WGS84. So they think that it represents the shape of the Earth in most locations, but in some locations there is a deviation, so it cannot represent. And in some other locations, some countries such as uh, USA has developed an ellipsoid which can best represent the shape of the Earth around USA, so that's called North America coordinate system. Okay. Likewise, many countries have developed their own ellipsoid line. So this is not uh, sometimes global based, which doesn't work for regional fitting. So regional fitting is often required. So, so the first thing is to determine the ellipsoid, and the other thing is to determine the datum. Datum defines the reference system that describe the size and the shape of the Earth, and also the origin of the orientation. So a datum is defined by a spheroid, which approximates the shape of the Earth, and the spheroid's position relative to the center of the Earth. So the purpose of datum is two. One, it defines the shape. The other is it defines the ellipsoids or the spheroid's position relative to the center of the Earth. So while a spheroid approximates the shape of the Earth, and a datum defines the position of the spirit related to this. So a datum provides a frame of reference for measuring location on the surface of the Earth. So here are some examples of a datum and the ellipsoid or the spheroid. This is the name of the ellipsoid and this is the name of the datum. Okay, this is a global best fit. The name of the ellipse is called WJS84 and the datum is WJS84. If you come to Ethiopia, in Ethiopia, in the case of Ethiopia and Sudan, we are using an ellipse called Clark 1880 and a datum called Adindan. So the center of this Adindan is this location. It is Adindan Zoo, so we use it. So the special coordinate system, the ellipsoid is Clark 1880 and the datum is Adindan. There are different countries which use different uh, datum and ellipsoid systems. So 
Another important thing that you need to know in defining a coordinate system is projected, I mean, uh, map projections. This works only for projected coordinate system. If you are using projected coordinate system, then you need to know first what map projection is. So map projection usually define the spatial relationship between locations on Earth and their relative location on a flat map. So we, we need map projection when we convert geographic coordinate system into projected coordinate system. So projected coordinate system, as its name implies, it is a projection result from a flat map, I mean from the three-dimensional surface to a flat map. So there, there must be a spatial relationship between the locations on the surface of the Earth and location on map. So this creation of spatial relationship between location on Earth and location on the map is defined by map projection. So during map projection, some distortion are inevitable. Conformality and distance distortion, direction distortion, scale distortion, area distortion are always there. So you cannot avoid this distortion during projection. But you can maintain one of the distortion and pre you can preserve one of the distortion and allow other distortions to occur. So for example, if you keep the shape to be preserved, the scale, the direction, the area will be distorted. So some projection minimizes distortion in some of these parameters at the expense of maximizing error in others. So some projections are attempt, attempt to only moderately distort all of these properties. So it's almost impossible to preserve all of these parameters without distortion. You can only keep one parameter and let distort the remaining parameters during map projection. So there are different, I mean, the, there are different uh, classification of map projections. One of them is conformal map projection. When local shapes are preserved, then the map projection system is called conformal projection. When area is preserved, the map projection is called equal area projection. When the distance is preserved, it is called equidistance. When direction is preserved, then it is called azimutal projection. It also be classified, can also be classified into uh, different ways uh, based on the, the geometric surface that the sphere is projected on. There are cylindrical projection, conical projection, azimutal, and miscellaneous projection. So look at this one. So we're going to project the real world, the whole globe, into a cylindrical projection. So, so this then is, it's called cylindrical projection, but this is normal. Since the equator is tangent to the cylinder, so it's called normal. Then traverse, transverse, transverse cylindrical projection. When the latitude, no, longitude of zero touches the cylinder in tangent form, then it's called transverse cylindrical projection. When the cylinder touches the cylinder in a different location no, than the equator or longitude of zero, then it's called oblique cylindrical projection. When the projection is performed using cone, it's conical projection. When the projection is performed using plane, then it's called planar projection, but it is polar. Planar equatorial, planar oblique projection. <clears throat> now let's talk about the most commonly used map projection, which is called transverse Mercator. What is the name transverse indicates? As I told you earlier, transverse is what? When the globe touches the cylinder at longitude of zero. So that is what transverse is. So this is UTM, Universal Transverse Mercator. Now you can define what UTM is, Universal Transverse Mercator. It uses, it uses 
a cylindrical projection it is a it is a cylinder it is a cylindrical projection system and it is tangent to the central meridian central meridian means it's longitude of zero so often used to portray areas with larger north south than east west extent so universal transverse mercator projection is used to define horizontal position horizontal positions worldwide dividing the surface of the earth into six degrees each mapped by transverse mercator projection look at this example this is utm zone numbers so each of the divisions represents six degree because if you have this one uh, this is uh, six degree and six six degree so ethiopia is located at around here if you know this one it, it is 37 and it is above the equator so if you are using utm projection you have to know the zone of your location of interest for example if you are using ethiopia ethiopia uses utm projection system zone 37 is the most commonly used so why we project our data from geographic coordinate system data often comes in geographic and spherical coordinate system and the, this geographic data cannot be used for area calculation so we need to convert from the geographic data into projected coordinate system some projection works better for different parts of the globe giving more accurate calculations so these are the two reasons so there are a couple of issues that you need to know in projection systems no projection can preserve all of the properties as a result all flat maps are distorted to some degree so you have to know this one so all flat maps that you see today are distorted to some extent so they are not perfect as a map maker you can decide which properties are most important choose a project that suits your need okay if the shape of the S or the shape of your area or the shape of your feature is much more important than any other property such as distance angle then you go for a projection system that can preserve area okay so there are a couple of points to consider when choosing projection which special property do I want to preserve do I want to preserve area distance angle or something like that where is the area that you are mapping am i mapping around polar region am i mapping around equator region so you use different so if you are using a polar region if you are if you are using a data in a polar region most of the time you use cone conical projection for example like this because they are they are best represented by conical projections if you are around an equator you are you have to use cylindrical projection okay now let's come to our lecture eight that is about spatial analysis function okay this is a very crucial part of geographic information system what makes gis unique from other similar you know subjects is it is a spatial analysis function okay what are these spatial analysis function if you go to ArcGIS software, you have toolbox. One of the most important toolbox is Spatial Analyst Toolbox. Okay, you will have a bunch of tools that you can use for GIS: conditional spatial analysis, density spatial analysis, distance extraction, generalization, hydrology, interpolation, map algebra. All of these are spatial analysis. So what operations are typical used as a spatial analysis function in GIS? These are the operations. Spatial analysis in GIS involves three types of operations. There are attribute query operation and spatial query operation and deriving new data from existing data. These are the main three main purposes of spatial analysis in GIS. So you query attribute. Attribute means what? It is an information attached to some spatial location that explain that feature okay spatial query means in related to space and you derive new data from the existing data okay these are the purposes 
For example, attribute query, it is a process of selecting information by asking logical questions, such as what? The identification of all pulses for a specific land use type. Okay? You have, for example, uh, select a land use, for example, landowners within a specified distance from the parcel to be rezoned identified through spatial query like this. This is a basic example of for spatial query. For example, search for parcels within one kilometer of the freeway. You have, you may have a road and you have so many parcels around it. If you want to select parcels within one kilometer of the main road, you can use spatial query, okay? And you may derive the server. Another important spatial analysis function is map algebra. So the best toolbox that you can use is raster calculator in ArcGIS. So inputs can be raster datasets or raster layers or constants or numbers. So you can perform mathematical operation. operation. So three groups of mathematical operations are available in raster calculator. You can do arithmetic spatial analysis boolean spatial analysis and relational arithmetic spatial analysis means you can you can make addition subtraction division multiplication you can do boolean operation boolean operations means what absence presence map you can do relational map relational means greater than less than or equal to maps so here are some examples of map algebra suppose you have map a you can produce map c on map A after adding 10 in each pixel, 5 plus 10 is 10, 15. So you have now a new map. If you have these two maps, you can add map A, map B, produce map C. Look at, and you can also perform different, a little bit uh, unique calculation, map A minus map B over map A plus map B. This is, this is an operation that we usually use for normalized difference vegetation index okay normalized difference vegetation index calculation is the best example of raster calculator it is through gis that we can able or that we are able to compute uh, uh, ndvi and produce some kind of exciting result out of the original satellite image okay you can also perform different if scenarios Okay, if scenarios, if and only if scenarios. Look at this. Produce map C if and only if map A is forced, yeah? then assign a value of one. Otherwise, put a question mark. Okay, so you have only map A, then you are expected to derive new data set given this condition. If this pixel is forced, assign one. Otherwise, if it's not, Put question mark. That's now we can combine two conditions using end and produce new result. If map A is forced, yeah, for example, uh, map A is forced, this pixel is forced, okay, and map B is 700. 7 means 700. Map B pixel is 7. Two conditions are satisfied. If it is True, then you assign a value of 1. If it is false, you assign a value of 0. Then you produce map C2. Okay? So try to exercise this uh, example. So make sure that you have understood this thing very well. So if you are given this kind of conditions, you are expected to produce maps. Okay. Another special operation is reclassify operation. Okay. Reclassify a raster data means replacing input values with new output values. You can reclassify the original one. Another is interpolation function using inverse distance weight, Kriging, and Tyson polygon methods. And another important issue is topographic spatial analysis function. Most of the time, we use these topographic functions for derivation of slope, aspect, gradient. So you can also derive using um, contours, using uh, topographic functions. You can derive slope, aspect, hillshade. Yeah. 
Another important spatial analysis function is overlay operation. Through overlay operation, you can perform clip, erase, split, identity, union, and intersect operations. These are uh, very useful during overlaying operation. You may need to uh, overlay city, sub city maps, road maps, uh, different land use, topographic maps, so that you can represent the real world. Okay, so this is a very, uh, very brief lecture about global positioning system. It's very brief, just it, will, it helps you understand the basic issues in global positioning system. Okay, so you may uh, re read this slide about GPS. Okay. If you have any question, you can uh, you can uh, forward me questions through email. Okay. So that's it. Thank you very much.